think it might be interesting to get a sense of realism and non-realism in mathematics. Would somebody like to pick up on that? Explain what it is? Well, I'm happy to talk about Platonism versus formalism that she mentioned and so on and what are these things. So Plato is, you know, uh, Alfred North Whitehead once wrote that all of Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, so he was a very <laughs> smart person. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe it's best what he thought is maybe best explained by his allegory of the cave. He said that we humans, you know, are like prisoners in a cave. Somebody's throwing shadows on the wall of the cave. The prisoners are forced to see the shadows. And that's what they think reality is about. So Plato basically said mathematics exists in some world out there. Uh, this is a platonic world of mathematical forms. So when I draw a circle on a piece of paper, that's not the real circle. The real circle is in that world of mathematics. This is just a crude approximation for that circle. Uh, most working mathematicians are Platonists in their hearts. Namely, they think that mathematics has this existence out there, and we're merely discovering the truths of mathematics. Uh, the school that uh, Rebecca described before of the formalists, uh, she actually used this, this uh, analogy of chess. Basically says, no, no, it's all just, you know, I write down some rules and, or some set of axioms, and I can derive all of mathematics from that. It's like I give you the rules of chess, we play chess. I change the rules, we play a different game. Basically, the idea is I write down one set of axioms, I get some form of mathematics. I change the axioms, I get another mathematics. And the best example of this was the Euclidean geometry that we all learn in school. It was based on a set of 10 axioms, one of which said that from if you have a line and a point outside the line, you can pass a single parallel line to that line. Mm. That was thought to be truth from God until the beginning of the 19th century, when three mathematicians independently showed that actually you can dispose of that axiom altogether, and you can develop new mathematics, one that can be described on a surface curved like a saddle, one on a surface like a sphere, mm -hmm. and so on, in which this uh, axiom doesn't hold true at all. And those are equally good descriptions of space, you know, and everything. So basically, formally say, write down the axioms, give me what there is. What Gödel did was that he pulled the rug underneath this entire premise. He basically showed that no formal system, no system of axioms you're going to write are going to ever capture all the truths of mathematics. This is a simple way of saying this. You know, in physics, I, I'm a physicist, we, people here may have heard the term theory of everything. We strive to get this theory of everything in physics. What Gödel's theorem shows that there is no theorem of everything in mathematics. Namely, you cannot you know, write down some set of axioms and from that derive all of mathematics. So these were the, the tensions between these particular groups. On top of that, there was this third group, which is that of the logicists, mm. which is people like Bertrand Russell, Gottlob Frege, and others said, no, 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 no. It all actually comes out of logic. I can write down some axioms of logic. For example, I tell you, either the butler killed the millionaire or his daughter killed him. And then I tell you, the daughter didn't kill him. Then you have to conclude that the butler did it, and this conclusion is not dependent on how old is the butler, what's the length of the nose of the daughter, or any such thing. <laughs> so there are some axioms of logic. And Gottlob Frege said that he could prove all of arithmetic, and by that I mean even 1 plus 1 equals 2, from some axioms of logic. And that looked extremely good. I mean, you know, this was almost everybody was happy. Because, you know, the formalist said, OK, it's all a game, but maybe there is a mother of all games. Mm -hmm. uh, the Platonist said, oh, if it all comes from some axioms of logic, surely those are somewhere there in that world of mathematics, you know, and so on. So all of this looked very good, except that when Frege was ready to send his fat book to the print, Bertrand Russell sent him a paradox, which is a little bit like 
what is sometimes called the barber's paradox. Mm -hmm. You know, there is this barber who has this sign, I shave mm -hmm. all and only the men of the village who don't shave themselves. And this all sounds perfectly logical because the, mm -hmm. the men who shave themselves don't need the services of the barber and the barber shaves everybody else. Until you stop and ask, okay, but who shaves the barber? <laughs> and if the barber shaves himself, he's one of those men that shave themselves and therefore he doesn't shave himself. <laughs> if, if the barber doesn't shave himself, then he's one of those that don't shave himself and then he has to shave himself. <laughs> so the, the paradox that, that Russell sent to, uh, to uh, Frege was not quite this paradox, but it had a similar flavor to it. And so it basically showed that our logical system can be fallible. Um, so there was a sense that the whole foundations of mathematics became rather shaky. And this is what, what for me as a physicist makes the puzzle even bigger in the sense that still while these foundations were shaking of mathematics, mathematics became this extraordinarily powerful tool in explaining the universe around us. How can you explain the whole universe with something that has such shaky tools? 